All right, uh, before the seminar starts, uh, there are a few announcements for uh, today. So the emergency exit is behind you guys. There are two emergency exits, and the restroom is, uh, if you go out, walk out from here, there will be a restroom outside. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet uh, in the back, uh, somewhere in the back. And then, uh, please also, I was told, there is an evaluation form. Uh, please also fill this in this at the front desk. Okay. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our uh, speaker for this distinguished lecture today, uh, Dr. Masayoshi Tomizuka. Actually, he has a very long resume, so I will mention some of the highlights. So, uh, Dr. Tomizuka is a distinguished professor at the Mechanical Engineering Department in UC Berkeley. He also wears several other hats, including uh, Director of CEO of Berkeley Education Alliance of, for Research in Singapore, Paris, and also uh, associate, associate Dean uh, for School of Engineering uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, he served as Program Director in the National Science Foundation from 2002 to 2004, and as President of American Automation, Automatic Control Council, AACC, from 1998 to 1999. Uh, he's a fellow of ASME, IEEE, ISAC, and Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Perhaps a major record that he set up at Berkeley is uh, the supervision of over 100 PhD students to completion. Uh, that was in 40 years. Hmm. And I was fortunate to be in number 103. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Tomizuka is the recipient of a number of awards, including a uh, Journal of Dynamic Systems Measurement Control Best Paper Award, uh, DSCD Outstanding Investment Award, uh, uh, Oldenburg Medal from ASME, and uh, Raganzini Award from AACC. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure, and let's welcome our speaker today. Thank you very much for a nice introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this seminar series. This is my first visit to Connecticut, and I was waiting for some of my students to teach here, and that's what happened. So it's very nice to come and see. Probably for him it's not new. I will be sharing some of uh, recent work in my laboratory. It says recent advances in robotic control of factory automation, but it's recent advances in my laboratory, mechanical systems control laboratory. In fact, I think the, the work I'm reporting here is a collection of the student work. Quite a few students, current student and recent student who graduated from the lab, uh, some, some are now teaching at elsewhere, and also the, I forgot to list Wenji Chen. Wenji Chen is a former student, but he now works at Panuk, so he's our technical contact now. And also another technical contact at Panuk is Dr. Kiyonori Inaba. He's in charge of robotics business at FANUC. In addition to the, search, the support from FANUC, a good number of my students have got so-called Berkeley Fellowship. It's a special fellowship given to the most outstanding applicant, either domestic or international student, and it's given by the Berkeley campus. And I'm glad that some of them have joined my group. So robots in manufacturing now and the future, there are lots of things going on. And intelligence and autonomy are more and more attributes of industrial robot. And learning and adaptation is a very important function. And also, robots must be able to perform their task environment with significant uncertainties. That's why the robot may have to come with good sensors, vision sensor, and so forth. But instead of making just robots alone, robust the, the 
intelligent and autonomous. Another interesting approach is how we can make the best of two worlds. Okay, human and robot. Human is good in certain things. Human is quite intelligent and they are flexible and also they can be really good in some of the things they have not seen before. Okay, so take that kind of advantage of the human and then the take advantage of the robot. Robot never get tired. Robot, robot does not quite complain. It works hard and it can repeat the same thing many, very reliably many times. So we try to combine best of the two worlds there. Okay, and collaboration of robot and human is becoming a big topic. And again, the recently National Robotics Initiative 2 has been announced, but collaboration of robot and human is listed as an important topic there. So my talk will be, I just finished introduction. I think two topics related to the human-robot collaboration first two, and also the last one is to make the robot operation, robot more intelligent by iterative learning control. I try to cover three topics. If time does not allow, I might not go into the third topic, but let me try. And first leads to teaching and teaching or learning by demonstration. I will explain what leads to teaching is in a second. It's a work by two of my students, Te Tang and Xin Zhang Lin, both are doing PhD. Okay, so robot appears many places in the production line, precision assembly, precision grinding, uh, etc. And in doing this, of course, nice to have robot equipped with all kinds of sensors to make intelligent robot, but this teaching pendant plays a very important part often in operation of the robot. First, you have to teach the robot how to move <coughs> the space, and often people use this teach pendant to move robot manually and let robot controller remember some key points. To minimize the work, some of the use of the vision sensor and so forth will help release the work from the worker to program through teach pendant. But teach pen, teaching by teach pendant, teaching by teach pendant is still a lot of time consuming work. So we would like to minimize that aspect. So that's where we the so-called leads to teaching is coming in. Actually, I will show some leads to teaching and learn demonstration, learning <coughs> from demonstration by taking this peg hole insertion with very tight tolerance. This is a classic problem, but how we make use of that kind of te new technique in this operation. Okay, so peg hole insertion this, is, this shows at least three phases. We have to bring the peg to, close to the hole. Then we have to align the peg and hole. And if they come very close to each other, then only remaining is to insertion. The current method, classical way of doing, is for the approaching phase, you use teaching pendant. Robot move to that hole. Or to, to release operator from teaching pendant, we may be able to use vision center, but you still have to do setup time and so forth. You have to invest. Now, for this part, proposed method is leads to teaching by human. It's a very direct way of teaching robot where to go. Now, alignment phase, essentially, the, the there is no good alignment phase in the current method. So you are supposed to do bring the robot fairly, robot and the fact the peg <coughs> align fairly close to each other. If the, the, they are aligned almost plus minus three degrees, insertion becomes rather easy. So 
you have to do a good job in doing this. <coughs> and this teaching actually is not best suited for this alignment. So we will develop some new method for this alignment, which is quite easy to automate. And finally, insertion. The classical way is so-called force damping control. Essentially, the, how we will adjust the velocity direction to move the peg in response to the force measurement. So there are force and velocity <coughs> two variables, and relating those two, essentially it's a damping type of action. So classical way of doing damping control, and it has been successful in many cases, but as the tolerance becomes tighter and tighter, it becomes a bit tricky, and we develop a bit more elaborated scheme so, than the damping control through the learn from demonstration. Here we learn from human, <coughs> the operator. So approaching phase, so essentially, the this is lead through teaching. The operator grabs the, the end of the robot and guides the robot towards the goal. It's essentially a force control. Force sensor is mounted, and as the operator tries to pull, the force sensor detects the direction, and then once direction is detected, it converts the, the spatial direction information, a velocity information is converted to the joint velocity by some kinematics, and then you just do the standard robot control. <coughs> so this is a block diagram for doing lead through teaching. It's intuitively very appealing. It's, uh, the operator really doesn't, know, doesn't have to know the detail of this. Robot moves in the direction he directed. So is it basically specifying the trajectory, right? Reference trajectory is what the human is doing. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so it's intuitive to the user, and it's you incorporate human ability, human vision, and so forth naturally. But human is operating so close to the robot, so we have to be conscious about safety. In this case, he is holding a, some emergency stop button, and also we cannot make the boundaries too large. And also with this method. Making the hole and peg aligned is rather difficult. So instead of trying to accomplish everything, we bring the peg close to the hole. <coughs> for alignment phase, what we do is for the variety of reasons, the peg and hole may not be aligned well. We would like to achieve this kind of goal for making insertion part easy. And the error is due to lots of things. Greater than plus minus three degree, this teaching is not quite linked to the error across in this range. And also there may be machining error from the surface. It looks like almost perpendicular, but the hole may not be straight. The, the surface may be tilted. Lots of reasons that the actual hole and peg are not quite aligned. If you do how, how human does, he doesn't try to bring the <coughs> completely aligned from the beginning. In this case, what he does is he drops the edge to the hole, and then based on that, he brings the peg at the almost perpendicular to the hole. So initially, it makes actually so-called two-point contact instead of three-point contact. And when it makes two-point contact, it can easily align. And we try to automate this. And the <coughs> Tetan did some analysis when the robot The robot is making some two-point contact. Actually, if we have a force sensor, actually three-point contact, 
if the robot is making contact here and here and here, three point contact, the, based on the force measurement, if you <coughs> utilize the force measurement, there is some, some equation that he came up with, which can estimate the tilt angle very accurately. Okay. And this is the uh, actual angle, and this is the uh, angle estimated from this formula. <coughs> the, you can see that the point, the, these data points are mostly on the 45 degree. So if you can actually estimate where the tape is, and also the three-point contact, what the angle is, you can just make correction for that amount. <laughs> so this is shows after making three point contact it, every time it could be different but it's very easy to make alignment compensation this part is done automatic ok then finally the insertion phase how we can make a smooth insertion Okay, so essentially we observe what human does. Okay, here is a robot. Human is doing some look at the angle and so forth, or force, and then human makes some adjustment of the peg angle. Okay, so this part is what human does, and we will try to model this part okay, <coughs> by observing the human action. And once this model is made, actually we no longer need a human, essentially something we learned from the, the, by observing human, we can just do the insertion. Okay, and for doing that, okay, we made a gadget, which is almost like a, some, the end effector which was holding the pen in the previous the movie, uh, but this is this part is supposed. This part is supposed to be human to grab, and human grab this and make this insertion. Force sensor is placed here, so in this arrangement, uh, we can measure exactly what is the force <coughs> to take and hold uh, interacting interaction force, and then measure this force, and also it has got several active markers in this graph okay, So this is human motion capture system to observe. So by doing this, we can observe the position change of the marker, or we can estimate the velocity in what direction the human is making correction. So the relation between the force and velocity is the important thing. And we would like to know the relationship between these two, sensed force and correction, or correct, corrective velocity, how human adjust this. Okay, so we estimate the I hat based on force, and we try to identify what kind of relationship exists between F and the I hat. <coughs> okay, and for doing this, essentially we correct data so this is from one experiment, and there is some section which is relevant for to the insertion in this time history, and we just pick up that part for the learning, and we repeat experiment, but each experiment might take different time, and we have to somehow normalize the data against time axis, so the time warping is done. And then we generate a map between F and velocity. And after generating a map, the actual force by the human, which is then is fairly closely regenerated by the, the mapping that we have met. So, doing 
everything, putting everything in the loop, the <coughs> block diagram looks like something like the robot is <coughs> robot essentially we force sensor will measure the interactive force and once we measure the interactive force land module will estimate in which direction the peg has to be moved dd and then that information is collected to the joint space and then standard feed forward give a control for the joint and uh, joint axis <coughs> following we complete the block diagram <coughs> and all doing all of this the whole scenario <coughs> looks like this first my lead through teaching says randomly placed hole and bring the peg to the end uh, through the hole by lead through teaching and then tilt angle estimation by formula magic formula we had make correction then <laughs> go to hole insertion part using developed using the mapping that we learned from the human operator <clears throat> okay, so this is the whole now we have done this the peg hole insertion we did something similar thing for grinding all kinds of operations but talking with FANAC people they have automated many operations but one area that they have not done so much automation is using the, the, the dealing with deformable object, okay, like cable. Okay, this is for something making this kind of harness and some insertion. Okay, this is a very difficult operation for them to automate, still relying on human. And difficulty in the deformable manipulation is that we can teach robot by doing some training. In the training phase, we might be using this kind of deformable object. But actually, when we have to test that cable may be completely different Based completely different ways. So position, scaling, deformation. So each time it looks like a new object to the robot, even if you use vision systems. So that makes the learning a little bit challenging. So there are some attempts to do the deal with this kind of deformation. So say this is training phase. And this is testing phase. One method is TPS, uh, the RPM. It's fast, so-called robust point matching. But it is, is, we first make correspondence of several endpoints. And then we try to find a smooth map, simple spline, find the mapping function, which is essentially <coughs> map this point there, this point there, this point there, and so forth. And once we make this simple prime, the same mapping can be used to map some grid. Grid can be mapped this way. And also, the, some of the trajectory in the original mapping space. In the testing phase, it, if it plays a little different, it can be mapped in the, the, the test plane by the same mapping. And Peter Abil's group really shows that this method is really good method for certain application, but not necessarily for all kinds of operations. <laughs> Even for the one-dimensional cable, the, we have some problem. And this is a simple case. Suppose 
the spring is placed this way during the training, but during testing, spring is placed similar, but a little bit different. And the question is what will happen if we learn this kind of strategy and doing the same thing after this TPS, RP, RP, and mapping, it didn't quite accomplish because some deformation of the, the space. So TPS, RPM, in this case, it was brain testing, training, it was placed this way, but testing, again, it was like this. It was stretched straight in this direction. But in this case, if we try to repeat, essentially this robot tend to pull the string too much. So this robot could not keep the, the other end stay at the same place. So this is one limitation of TPS. RPM and observation is resulting shape at test unlike that at training and overstretch the object manipulation. And one reason is lose object structural information. So Te came up with um, another approach he calls TSM RPM method. The robust point matching part is the same, but you utilize a similar matching, robust point matching method, but tangent space mapping. He shows that tangent space mapping is a good method to keep some structure information. For example, this is a rope at training, and this is a <coughs> rope at test. He evaluates the tangent around these arc lengths. When it tangent is something like that, and for the Rope at the test, tangent may change like this. Then he makes mapping of this tangent to this, the, this tangent line. And as the rope is moved during training, he will estimate how the tangent should be moved in the testing with a configuration. And he can compute <coughs> using the same mapping <coughs> function that he create from tangent space mapping. And so on. Okay. So he can generate this much data. Then he will convert this data, or well, this data, to how the endpoint should be moved. So TSF RPM algorithm the key part is here, integrate to get the tangent trajectory of grassing point, and by integrating, the, he can get how he should be moving the other end of the string in the space. So this is uh, some simulation result. This is training C1. And test case, the right one is a new method. So by doing new methods, no stretching took place. <coughs> Training scene two. The new method brings the cable to closer to what was achieved during training, like in this case, low winding. old method and new method. Again, the new method try to stretch the rope too much. <laughs> so, we think that this is one progress in dealing with uh, 
uh, deformable, handling deformable objects. There may be even better methods exist, but we are happy to see if we can make some progress there. So PSM, RPM algorithm is proposed for deformable manipulation. And achieve better shape recovery by maintaining tangent information of deformable objects. We simply say better because there may be even better method. Okay, then I would like to move on to another topic for the robot-human collaboration, algorithmic safety measure for intelligent industrial robots. This is work by Chan Liu Liu, and she is almost finishing her PhD. And co-robot is a very interesting topic. And this is an old NRI report, a uh, solicitation, not just the, the NRI 2. This is from previous NRI. They have this diagram. They were suggesting the co-robot type of thing as co-worker, co-explorer, co-defender, co-inhabitant, and so forth. Our research belongs to something like co-worker. <clears throat> so there are lots of interesting issues for this co-robot area, from cognition, networked multi-agent approach, hardware, software architecture, etc., etc., sensor perception. They are all very good, interesting research topic. But in doing this, bringing robot and human close to each other, something we have to really look into is a safety. By doing this, whether human will not be hurt by robot, or robot human will not be damaging the robot. Okay, the ro robot is not that cheap, so we don't want to see that the robot is damaged either. So, essentially, to assure safety, there are these several levels of protections. And first level of protection is if the robot and human never collide, that will be very nice. But second level of the, the protection is, unfortunately, if the human and robot come in contact, how we can identify, detect that they are in contact as soon as possible, and what kind of protective measure we can take. Now, industry is very quick in responding to this second protection. This is from ANAC. Okay, so they, ANAC robot is normally yellow, but if you see green robot from ANAC, this is for safety conscious robot. This is for human <coughs> robot collaboration. Apparently, I think they produce this robot, and automotive manufacturer is welcoming this addition. So, need definitely exists in automotive industry. And safety, <coughs> as they assure, robots stop immediately when human touches it. Because that's not a rocket science. They just happen to have a very sensitive force sensor at the base. So, if anything touch that information, <coughs> the travel to the sensor at the base of so the robot immediately stops. And also, they cover the robot with something soft. Okay, so that's why it's green. So standard robot cover black <coughs> soft material. And they meet some international safety standard, ISO, this number. <coughs> So this is a green robot working close to the automotive manufacturing line. This is, I think, by Panak Simulator. So this is a typical scenario. Okay, so. To put spare tire in the workspace, tire is not that right. And you have to take a very weird shape, so you might injure back. So let's do robot that part, but final adjustment of the position, human will do. 
and then human can do the fixing and so forth. Okay, so to make it sure it's safe, if, you, if somebody touches, the robot immediately stops. And if you push, the robot can essentially it follows the force sensor. It's almost like it's teaching. So you can do direct <coughs> teaching, deep school teaching is possible. But it's made really worker or operator friendly by variety of ways. Any anyway, uh, the force sensor is playing a very important role. So this is their answer to this second protection. Chandu's work is more related to the first level of protection. Essentially, it's a real-time collision avoidance algorithm. Okay, for doing that, essentially, she, she thinks that robot human are all mixed in one environment, and each of them are treated as an agent. Agent one, two, three, four, and so forth. So, in the example below, this first agent is actually the automated robot. And the other agent uh, is a, as a human or as a robot. Essentially, this robot has to make sure that it will not collide with any of the other agent. Each agent has got sensing function, sensing actually all over the place, and then decision-making function. So, because we are interested in robot control, first agent we lump all of them into one box here. So the question is then getting information there. Again, this part is the big leap. We have to get information from other agents. That may include some perception, prediction of the other people's motion and so forth. Responding to that, we have to make decisions how this robot Input, control input should be determined. How do you get a fetch? Excuse me? How do you get a fetch? How do I get one? A fetch, the, the rest of the system. You need to have some idea, my model of the rest of the system. Right? Model? Yeah, this is, the, this is a standard robot dynamics model. And information coming from here is all from sensors or some other. Uh, if you have local... So if the other people are agents, how do you get that? <coughs> hmm? If the other agents are humans. Human yeah. or... Yeah, hu okay. Our agents are human, yeah. Okay. Vision system. Okay, all kinds of sensors. Okay. okay. So uh, suppose you have motion capture system. Human may have to wear for safety or some special suits. Nice. It's nice that if we don't have to let humans do something special, but that, that part is also she's working, but it's not part of this architecture that I'm talking about. So a big assumption in this case is this information is coming. Okay, so it's essentially... Uh, it's very fast. Optimal control problem is certainly robot has got certain mission. It has to go there and do some work, or robot has to move there to do some work. So how it can efficiently achieve the mission? Okay, so it's a typical optimization. Minimize certain J function to go there and do. Subject to the constraint, of course robot dynamics must be satisfied, and also uh, there is human XH, the state here, XH and X. Easy way to understand this. There must be certain <coughs> separation between XH and XR. Okay, so some distance has to be kept. <coughs> so they have to belong to the so called self set in that sense. And also, robot control itself is constrained. So this is a sort of constraint. Or the three constraints in minimizing this 
host function. Now, if we just look at the one in this red broken line, this is a very standard optimization problem. If we remove the safety constraint, it's a just standard optimization problem. So, in fact, this part makes the problem nonlinear, non convex, and difficult. So, Chan Liu says that, okay, I will solve this easy part first and take care of this part as I see how the robot and as a human, as a robot, they are coming too close to each other and so forth. So, it's a two way approach. And in doing that, XH, we might do online learning. And safety constraint, so after looking into this constraint, if we can constrain this constraint translated into constraint on control, it turns out to be much easier to handle. So if the robot is moving in the direction to one human, input has to be changed. Robot input has to be changed to avoid that. And this has to be run, and this has to be defined. So, conceptually, what happens is, essentially, robot is STX1, represented by this axis, and human is represented in this X2 axis, and they are existing here, so safe, they are separated nicely. But, if we expect that the human is going to move down, robot cannot stay here. It has to come to a safe set. So it has to move down here or anywhere on this line. Most natural to be here. But... And you can say that this is a sort of safety index. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated than simply distance between X human and X robot, X1, X2, because of certain key function. Key function has to, to satisfy certain mathematical constraint. But this key function is designed, but as robot, robot moves, this T is, as when T is positive, positive means that T is above this level set. So this is dangerous zone. T dot is always decreased. <coughs> okay, so if you have this condition satisfied, once you are satisfied this constraint, T will never become positive again. So in that sense, we can define an invariant set. Okay, so you are has to be always satisfying this. And what we need to do is we find U R if the U computed from the, the optimization without looking into the constraint between X robot and X human is violating the self constraint then we have to find UR, which is closest to the current the U, which will be achieving the objective, but yet satisfying this condition. So this is the approach. So the control system looks like we have a robot. Efficiency controller is obtained by solving this part. Now, we didn't satisfy this constraint, but this constraint is now replaced by UR belonging to the self set control. And we safety controller essentially modifies the control if self constraint is not satisfied. It's something like if the UR 
is not belonging to the self set control. <coughs> it tries to find U R, which is belonging to the self set, and cross process to the original U R. We make control modification, something like this explained in this diagram. So this is the controller structure. And if there is some uncertainty in where the human may be moving, this is predicted essentially. If there is some uncertainty, essentially, robot has to be anywhere which would be prepared for the either scenario <coughs> x to end up to here, x r x to end up here. So the region that it can stay is now significantly smaller. And for every x, okay, so significantly smaller, so for every x there is some self-set of 10, and U R must satisfy <coughs> everything wherever X2 is coming. What if the pink band is right at the bottom? Here? No, the uncertainty, the uncertainty X2 hat. Suppose it's at the bottom of your uh, blue line, what do you do? Blue line? This one? No, the one that the... Okay, this, no. this one is the... Here. If, if it is at the... Uh, when X2 hat, we it's know right X2 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 hat is here, X1 should be anywhere on this line. What if it's below? But if we are not sure, X2 hat may be either here or here. We have to take a conservative approach that X1 has to come. Let's, let's see, so this end is determined from X2 hat above. And this end is determined by X2 hat even further down. Okay. So if we have the, in this region, X1 is in this region, essentially for any X2 appearing in this band, we can still keep. I think you need to have some more things, some more safety issues because you may just have to stop because if I bring the whole region down, where it is coincident with x1 axis, you wouldn't know what to do. What, you, I, you need, I need to be even made this smaller. But, yeah. Um, I, I, but I, I know that x2 can be either between here and here. And anywhere in this blue region, I know it's safe. But um, what if it is overlaps with the blue region and the white region? Your white region is unsafe. Okay, so I have to stay in blue region. So if I if X1 is within this region, X2 can be anywhere from here to here, and I can stay, X, X1, X2 will stay in blue region. You don't agree? No, because I can have the thing where it is, where, where? It, it is spanning both the blue region as well as the white region. My uncertainty region would be spanning both, in which case what do I do? Where than X2? Which, which point? That whole rectangle, I bring it to the bottom. Very the rectangle, I bring it to the bottom. Right. Okay, so now this, this, diagram, right. this now, diagram is made. The rectangular bottom is here. Right. If I, if I bring the rectangular bottom here, right. no point. Okay. So yeah. in that case, there is no place to go. We have to stop. Okay, so. You are just talking about different scenarios. Right, in this area where there is uncertainty, because I did, it could be about the thing. It if uncertainty is, is very deep, yeah. there is a chance that all you can do is to stop. So but I'm not talking about that situation. So you're taking care of the uncertainty with the width of this rectangular zone. <laughs> yeah. So it's given <coughs> the upper and lower bounds of the uncertainty. So so but, but if it overlaps, I'm not, so I'm not sure what you are worrying about. If it, if it is well, at, least, at least in the context of we formulate as a problem. Okay, you are challenging that formulation is wrong. I'm, no, 
I don't think you are considering the uncertainty very well. So. Yeah, uncertainty. It, it all depends on the. Actually, the we I have not even discussed how I estimate x to half. This is totally another problem. The answer prediction is. And since I'm not talking about a prediction problem, I don't think it's a fair criticism. Yeah. Generally, the safe set may be very complicated. Mm -hmm. it may not be complex. It may be hard, may be hard to get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you get that? And if it's not complex, what do you do? Not complex. Yeah. Generally, it's not complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is that easy to get? This, uh, so that, 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 that's why we cannot find a good way just looking at this set direct. So that's why she, um, she translated this problem into the UR. At least, if you, she is satisfying this condition, it will never get out this blue, blue region. Where it will be going is another issue. Okay, okay so this is several <laughs> simulation. Actually, it's a scanner-like robot is achieving a goal. And human will be coming in to achieve certain things. <laughs> yes, human is not coming in yet. So robot is just doing whatever task is given. But as soon as robot comes in, robot stay away from human. And when it's safe, robot moves and achieves objective. Okay, so this is another simulation. In this case, the human is represented by some point crowd, and robot is trying not to hit human, but yet try to achieve objective. And in different simulation, the, we are representing human in a different way. And to get some idea how much computational time is required to, to essentially predict whether we are safe or not. So if human is represented by 10 capsule or 2 capsule and so on, the spheres. In this case, very easy representation, but it's not very accurate. The, if human is surrounded by 2 capsule, robot will not be hitting the either of the capsule. So it's fairly fast to predict whether it's safe or not. As you increase the number of capsules, it takes more time. But Computation can be done fairly efficient, so we expect that it can be used in real time. And this next level of the simulation was human in the loop type of simulation. Human coming in, and robot essentially moving back and forth on this line. But as human is detected, robot is trapped. And human is not jumping around, so his motion is still continuous. So maybe that uncertainty band we are talking about will not be that huge. We are not fighting with athlete here. Okay, so finally, she already tested actually with a um, mobile robot. Instead of human, we are not really comfortable to bring human next to the robot and test. So we used a kind of robot, mobile robot, to replace human. 
and it works quite well. And she did that work as a part of internship at Fanuc, and so the test was quite successful. But we are a little bit refraining to show the, that video tape because it is too new result. The only constraint we receive is I cannot present the most recent stuff with industry partner. Okay, but that's something we have to pay. Okay, now I'm supposed to finish too. Yeah. Okay. So the final topic is robust iterative learning control for vibration suppression of industrial robot manipulator. This is to make the robot sort of more intelligent by using learning control method, but it has nothing to do with human-robot collaboration. And human-robot collaboration is by far still a much more exciting topic, especially in view of NRI2. So I think I, I will not talk about this because this part takes at least 10, 15 minutes. Okay. If you are interested in, the paper has been presented at the ASME conference, so you can take a look of the paper. Okay. So let me jump to the conclusion slide. Okay. So robots are more and more penetrating to various industrial applications, and robot is not used to, to, to make the labor cost low, but it is essentially to make whole automation more productive and higher quality and more flexible. And in doing that, adaptation than expected function of modern robot. And very exciting new topic is that robot and human work together to make manufacturing process more efficient, more flexible, and intelligent. And I touched the, some of our research in that area. And issue for for robot paradigm, important the issue is the safety. So so far we have emphasized this safety a lot. But also there are lots of issues. We are slowly starting. I have not package to present but Robots must have improved perception system for monitoring the progress of their tasks and those surrounding them, human workers and other robots. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for maybe two short questions. So teaching by demonstration depends on the skill of the operator. Mm. The operator is not very skillful, the teaching will not be very effective. Do you have some kind of idea, say, uh, how do you optimize this, uh, considering the skill is of the... At the moment, I think probably the, I would like to learn from skilled operator. And the, the maybe the, if operator is not skilled, the data may not be worth thought to run. He might still do, the, if it's a first time job, no, if no, no expert exists, okay, some, somewhere we have to start. But at least human can figure out how to do it. And once human can figure out what to do, at that stage, I would like to move to run by demonstration. But it's quite true. If, uh, uh, if we learn from a bad teacher, okay. <laughs> so much we can accomplish. But a safe set, do you want to consider dynamic aspect? Or no? Safe set? Yeah. The, it's mo mostly dynamic. It's a one few step prediction. Okay. okay, based on dynamic model. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hope the I'm thinking more beyond the robots, like uh, in general machines and humans mm -hmm. work together in creative tasks, like design with them. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts in that, that area? Uh, human. Humans and machines working together in design. Mm -hmm. 
So creating the, the task like a fan of video or like higher place, that kind of operation. Yeah, where we don't know what the end result is going to be. We only have some requirements. I think that the, most of the cases we can naturally define. And I think something I don't, we do not want to see is accident. Human is always, even momentarily, absent-minded. That's when accident takes place. So for that purpose, we have to carefully monitor the, the scene by sensing system. And whenever something dangerous situation is predicted, we have to take some action. Somebody be calling a human worker from back, and he might just look back. That, that's that's the that's kind of situation that we are told, thinking about. By the way, the, the, this approach has been very much relevant to autonomous driving. It's actually so-called mixed traffic automation. Automated car and human-driven car. That's a natural thing which would take place instead of preparing for completely autonomous lane and all the car is automated, the next phase will be some autonomous car and human-driven car for existing. Okay, so some automotive company is very interested in this approach. So after presenting this approach, I have essentially got two industry projects. One is from the automotive company. They would like to see how this technology can play a role when the automated car can safely maneuver on the mixed traffic. When the dangerous situation comes, he has to somehow change lane or slow down, take some action. So it's very similar to the factory floor situation. Factory floor situation is obviously uh, very relevant. So uh, currently, FANUC is funding goals for this one. Okay. Uh, is, okay. Just a very uh, general question yeah. for me. This is very interesting. So uh, you also uh, alluded to automated highways and, and uh, sort of robots and human mm -hmm. beings interacting together. Where is the scientific frontier pushing the researchers, bona fide researchers, not the application engineers, the researchers today? Software, hardware, actuators, sensors, material. Actually, if you look at this one slide, I can show you again. It's surrounded by the, the, the all kinds of things. So, so. Yes. <coughs> yeah, so. so Faduk engineers, for example, where do they feel the pinch? No, I think most? A, this in terms of uh, oops. Okay, science. <coughs> Scientific aspect of this call of okay, so this is from NSA. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are all some scientific change approaching pushing. For the safety, uh, it, it comes with software and also control theory. Okay, control theoretic <coughs> installation is very important. Of course, sensing cognition perception, that's very important. But then you can find self set all kinds of things. But another challenge is how you make the algorithm computationally efficient. Mm. Okay, because if it takes too long, you cannot use it in real time. So figuring out the algorithm which can implement that's a very interesting challenge also. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker again and thank you.